I'm delighted to introduce Court Johnson. Uh, we've particularly invited you, Court, because um, you, you've been running, you, you're a science blogger, you've been running a blog, you've, you've been writing about fibromyalgia, and we are really, really keen to both provide a service. We're the ME and Fibromyalgia Group, and we want to provide more information and as much science as we can to our members who've got a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. And we, um, it's easier to find science and information about ME, CFS than it is about fibromyalgia. But before we move on to that question, I just wondered whether you'd like to just introduce yourself, Court, and just say not only a little bit about yourself, but um, I'm intrigued to know where you are, because uh, uh, there's a slightly different backdrop to the one I've got in Sheffield. So uh, very, very warm welcome to Court Johnson. And would you like to um, introduce yourself? Sure. Sure. Yes, I, I am in uh, I'm in a slightly different uh, climate. Uh, I am camping out in, uh, in the Mojave Desert, the high, the high Mojave Desert in a Joshua Tree woodland uh, in uh, Eastern California. I actually do this. Uh, I actually do boondocking uh, year round. Uh, and I um, so I uh, I started uh, Phoenix Rising, a website called Phoenix Rising in the, I guess the mid 2000s. Mm -hmm. And my goal was, I kept coming across, you know, lots of bits of information on chronic fatigue syndrome. There was no uh, comprehensive, uh, there's no in-depth blogging on chronic fatigue syndrome at that time. So I, I created the Phoenix Rising website, you know, in order to kind of dig into chronic fatigue syndrome research uh, more. I had a, I have a master's in environmental sciences, so I felt pretty comfortable uh, uh, with uh, research materials, and uh, we created the forums. And then uh, I don't know, nine years ago, I left Phoenix Rising. I, I created uh, Health Rising, and I've been blogging ever since. I've done, <laughs> I've done many, 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 many blogs. Uh, I certainly can't remember all of them. I occasionally come across a blog I've written that uh, somewhere that I read, and I think that's pretty good. And I look up and it was me that wrote it. So I can't remember everything, <laughs> but uh, I've done many blogs on uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. And they're, they're mostly focused on, uh, they're mostly focused on research and treatment and advocacy. So, so Health Rising is my, uh, is my home now. And now we're focused on long COVID as well, and allied disorders as well, POTS and things like that. They all they all come together uh, in some ways. Brilliant. So thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Well, we're delighted yeah. to have you here, and um, um, yeah, Health Rising is an incredible um, resource of information. So strongly recommend um, everybody has a a really good dig around that and there's all sorts of information there and it's really well indexed as well which is which makes it um, really helpful to find what you might be looking for so it's just a brilliant piece of work and we're very grateful to you and not only that but you've managed to attend all sorts of conferences and wade your way through all sorts of science and actually make it comprehensible to us so uh, we're hugely grateful for your job of interpreting what is actually going on in the scientific world for our benefit so thank you um, it's very interesting, isn't it, with fibromyalgia? We've, we, yeah. we have found it difficult to find um, anything like as much kind of buzz, dialogue, conversation, blogging, um, information, research. Um, we've, we've found it, you know, there is so much less than there is amongst the MECFS community. And, um, and I wonder whether you've just got any reflections before we start on why why is that the case? Why has fibromyalgia and MECFS kind of gone slightly different avenues, do you think? It's, 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 it's a great question. It's, and I have thought about this. I have thought about this uh, before. And, and, and no surprise, there is a, I actually wrote a blog on this at one time. Uh, and uh, so they, they, it is very, it is very, it is very different. And the, what, what I came up with, the only thing I came up with is that the diseases started very, 
very differently. Disease, the, the kind of the community approach to the diseases started uh, very differently back when it, when MECFS in the God, I guess it was in the '80s uh, first got going. Um, there, a uh, uh, the first real advocacy, or one of one of the first advocate, there were two important uh, approaches to MECFS that started. One, a, a senior researcher who who discovered the HHV6 uh, virus decided that we needed they, they we needed a professional organization. MECFS needed a professional organization, and it needed international conferences. So right off the bat, there was a, there was an emphasis on bringing. Uh, uh, researchers in and kind of integrating them into the into the field uh, in an organized way, and then then another group sprung up about that call and called the Seafoods Association of America, and it was the dominant uh, crop fatigue organization over here uh, for many years, and from the beginning they also had a real emphasis on advocacy, um, and. Uh, and so that 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 emphasis has kind of that 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 has uh, that that that's been maintained through the years, and but but there's mm -hmm. also we also have you know these these research foundations we have these these large organizations over there invest in me in me, uh, me research UK uh, there's there are several I'm not I'm not aware of all of them, but these you know they they're all. Uh, they're all they're all active mm -hmm. they're all you know they're advocating um strongly they are raising funds for research and i, I don't know if it was because mecfs was just so behind the eight ball you know that was was such a uh you know it, it, there was so much uh i'm sorry i'm sorry if i'm stumbling around i got I had a terrible night's sleep last night so this this may happen throughout the interview but uh mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know if things were just so bad in the MECFS world that, uh, you know, it, it kind of sparked this, you know, this this kind of outgrowth of patient groups. But for some reason, that just never happened in fibromyalgia. There was a there was a major one major fibromyalgia patient group, and they did it. They did a great job, but there was there was really no attempt at advocacy, and uh, and since then, now since then there another fibromyalgia advocacy group has showed up in the past couple of years in the US. Mm -hmm. um, but but why fibromyalgia doesn't have the research foundations, why you know this kind of th these international conferences don't exist. We have international MBCFS has international conferences in the US, the UK, and Australia now. Why this kind of research infrastructure or this kind of disease infrastructure, you know, and and yeah uh, Solve the Solving MSFS initiative has created the patient registry, and ME Action has just created this um, this kind of in-depth dive into patient symptoms. You know, it's a community-based approach, and there's there's just all sorts of this creative stuff happening around chronic fatigue syndrome, and there's a lot of good research happening around fibromyalgia. You know, and and if you go on Facebook, there are these huge fibromyalgia groups, just absolutely huge fibromyalgia groups that just dwarf the size of the MECFS community. So all I can think is that it just, you know, this kind of community-based effort for some reason just never really got started in fibromyalgia. And, and it, you know, and it really should, it really should yeah. because these diseases, these diseases interact so closely and what we learned in fibromyalgia I believe will apply to MECFS and vice versa. And I, and I also believe that um, that long COVID, what we learned in long COVID is gonna to apply to MECFS. And I believe it'll also apply to fibromyalgia. Yeah. So, so I don't know, you know, it maybe it's just leaders that show up at particular times. Maybe that's it. Um, so but it's saying, a great question. Yeah, my, migraine yeah. went the same way. Migraine went the same way. Very little advocacy of migraine. You know, and migraine is a, it affects tens of millions of people in the U.S. and it still gets, it still gets crappy funding relative to the number of people it affects. So, 
advocacy is very is is a, is a very important uh, tool. Uh, and so, for some reason, some disease disease diseases it shows up, and others, for whatever reason, but it would it would be really good it would be really good to see it in fibromyalgia. Mm. I think everybody here would probably very strongly agree with you. And it's interesting you say how there is quite a lot of connection amongst people with fibromyalgia, but not the same level of campaigning and advocacy. So it hasn't got quite the level of profile. But you've you've mentioned that um, there is loads of research in fibromyalgia. So can you give us a kind of Cook's tour of, of the range of research that, that is around at the moment? What is what is reasonably current and um, particularly um, who are some of the names to watch? Well, there, there is, uh, even though fibromyalgia doesn't have this kind of community infrastructure and these kind of uh, independent research foundations, there is a lot of really interesting research going on in fibromyalgia. Um, one, of, one of the most uh, interesting uh, Areas is 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 a, an area that's uh, very hot in MECFS as well, and that's neuroinflammation. The idea that, or the finding really that that there's uh, that areas there's there's areas of the brain are experiencing inflammation, and that inflammation may be uh, tweaking tweaking the pain producing pathways in the brain, uh, causing the uh, the brain to trigger uh, sympathetic nervous system activation, um, the, or, you know, or the, which is called the fight or flight response, which, which can lead to a whole host of problems. Uh, the inflammation could be, um, could be damping down the ability of the prefrontal cortex in the brain, which is, um, the prefrontal cortex is kind of the latest and greatest um, the latest and greatest achievement of the brain, and it, it serves to tamp down the limbic system and the amygdala, which ramps up the fight or flight response, which causes the, uh, the nerves to get twitchy, which co potentially causes pain. Uh, so this neuroinflammation, this neuroinflammation thing is really interesting uh, because on, on, because the findings are different from other diseases, the findings in uh, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome, they're, they're, they're quite similar. And what they're finding is that there's uh, low levels of neural inflammation that are widespread, across widespread areas of the brain. Uh, and that's different from other diseases where neuroinflammation tends to be localized. Uh, though the reason it's taken so long to find neuroinflammation in chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia is that is there are two reasons. One is that the, the technology just wasn't there to find lower levels of neuroinflammation. And uh, only recently has it been, been developed. And, uh, and then when they started looking, uh, they have found it. Of course, the other reason is that research funding is uh, still really poor for both these diseases. They're not getting nearly the research funding that, that they should. Um, so, uh, but, but we have we have very innovative, we have a very innovative researcher in Jared Younger at the University of Birmingham in Alabama, who has actually developed a new technique to study neuroinflammation. It involves actually just uh, assessing the temperature of the brain. Uh, so he's one to take a look at. There's another researcher, uh, a Harvard researcher called named Marco Loggia, Logia, if I have his name right. And he, he's interesting because he studied neuroinflammation in, in other diseases, and he's a widely respected uh, researcher. And uh, when he looked at fibromyalgia, he, he again, he found it in widespread areas of the brain. So neuroinflammation is, it's a real thing, and it's a very interesting uh, thing to show up because, uh, Neuroinflammation is becoming a hotter and hotter topic in the medical world in general, and uh, and that means that diseases like Parkinson's and uh, 
uh, ALS and multiple sclerosis, you know, the, the neuroinflammation is found in all those diseases and they are actively looking for treatments. And uh, a treatment that applies to, you know, one of those diseases that can reduce neuroinflammation in those diseases may very well uh, apply to ME-CFS and fibromyalgia as well. So I think, I think neuroinflammation is a, a uh, really, a, really a fascinating topic, uh, a potentially very fruitful topic. We haven't had many studies in it, but we really need are more studies to pin that down. Uh, but it's a, uh, it just makes so much sense because so many of the symptoms in chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia can be caused by the brain. And we know the pain pathways, the pain producing pathways in fibromyalgia are tremendously activated. And, uh, so that's a real, that's a real, uh, there's a real opportunity there. Um, another, another hot topic is called small fiber neuropathy. And small fiber neuropathy are, in, in the case of fibromyalgia, it's actually called small fiber polyneuropathy, the kind, the type of uh, small fiber problems, small nerve fiber problems found in, in fibromyalgia. Um, are actually different enough that it's being named by a different term uh, than the small fiber neuropathy found in other diseases. And so, so small fiber neuropathy, the small fibers in the skin and the eye, small nerve fibers, very small unmyelinated nerve fibers in the skin and the eyes have become, uh, they've been disappearing uh, and or they've become smaller. That's the difference in fibromyalgia. They also become they also become smaller. No, nobody, nobody really knows what's causing this, but it is quite prevalent. It's found in about 40 to 50% of people with fibromyalgia. It's interesting because it's not, it's not a brain problem, you know, and so much research has, and so much really, uh, Fibromyalgia has been so in, interpreted as a central nervous system disease, and, in, and indeed it is, that's for sure, but this is, these, are, these are findings in the body. So the question is, what, what is causing these, what in the body is causing these things to happen? And it, you know, it, it, it suggests that there's, there's definitely more to fibromyalgia than the brain. And uh, so any, anyway, uh, the, the really interesting thing about these small fiber neuropathies is the question, they, is this question is how far widespread they are. Are they just in the eyes? And by the way, they're not harming the eyes. Don't, you don't have to worry about that. Are they just in the skin? Are they just causing more pain and sensory problems in the skin? Or because we know these small fibers are also found in the blood vessels. We know they're also found in the gut, you know, are, are, do people with fibromyalgia also have damaged small fibers in these areas? And if they do, uh, they could have widespread consequences, you know, regarding, you know, blood flows to the muscles, without regarding the ability of the gut, regarding gut motility and the ability of the gut to function well. And, uh, you know, as we've learned over, over time, the gut is a potentially tremendously important um, immune modulator. Uh, so we don't really know how the small fiber neuropathy uh, saga will end, but uh, there are some uh, pretty uh, there are some some really significant uh, researchers, uh, Ann Oaklander, uh, David Sistrom. Uh, oh, is Cellier? I cannot say her name, but she's from Germany. <laughs> uh, that are, are really, uh, really believe there's the potential for these small fi nerve fiber problems to uh, be producing a lot of havoc in fibromyalgia. Um, and one, one of the, uh, so there's that. And then there are uh, muscle and energy problems. And again, and again, this is like, you know, so much of the focus on fibromyalgia has been on the central nervous system. Uh, and as, as I said, there's, so, there's just plenty of evidence that, you know, that the pain producing pathways are tweaked, that the pain inhibiting pathways are, are not working correctly, are not, you know, are not working correctly, that the, 
that the that the nerves around the spinal column are you know are, are kind of getting triggered at the slightest at the slightest stimuli they're just like popping up and sending pain signals to the brain you know you know eg e allodynia and uh you know the, the they're sending pain signals where you know pain signals shouldn't be occurring the the, the muscles well, well we'll see the muscles don't appear to be damaged but the, ne the next part of this the next really interesting thing is muscle and energy problems so the, the, the studies over time have found a tremendous number of muscle problems in fibromyalgia which which you know it just kind of makes sense that's 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 what the name kind of refers to uh the you know muscle fiber pain and that's what they originally thought it was and um so over time uh and just recently uh but just recently there have been three or four really interesting muscle studies that have found muscle problems so there have been so a study found found high muscle pressure the muscles were under a lot of pressure in fibromyalgia um they muscle they found that the muscles are hyper excitable you know that they 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 just that they that they, they go off at the slightest stimuli and then the muscles are supposed to relax. They're supposed to like contract and then relax. And in fibromyalgia, they just don't relax. You know, they stay in that contracted, you know, you, you may uh, experience, I mean, I certainly experienced the muscles being in this kind of contracted, painful state uh, uh, often. Uh, they've also found high levels of oxidative stress you know, and reduced blood flows to the muscles. And then, then, a, then a, now, you know, over the past 10 years, I mean, this, this, this finding has become, uh, it's really pretty solid. They, they, they're, they're really pretty sure that they found mitochondrial problems in the muscles. So the, the muscles just, they're just not producing the energy that they should. And, and oddly enough, muscles that are, uh, that that don't, aren't able to produce uh, the amount of energy they should have 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 difficulty relaxing, uh, oddly enough. So, so and with regard to energy production, uh, low ATP levels. I I imagine most people know that ATP is the um, is what the mitochondria produce. Uh, low P ATP levels have been found all all over fibromyalgia. They've been found in the muscles. They've been found in the skin. They've been found in the platelets. They've been found in the plasma. They've been found in the nerve cells. They've been found in the immune cells. So if you're feeling fatigue, you know, if you're in pain, this this these mitochondrial issues could be causing all of that. And and there are it, interesting. I didn't realize this until recently, but that there is actually a real research thrust towards uh, showing that mitochondrial problems can cause pain. Uh, there, there are quite a few studies have suggest that. So that's another it's another hot topic. Uh, yeah, those are those are the I think those are the the biggies. I mean, there's some more. Uh, you know, the fibromyalgia. I've said, you know, fibromyalgia and MECFS are very close. Um, and, you know, studies, studies over the years are actually showing there, there's problems with uh, orthostatic intolerance. There's problems with blood flows to the brain. Uh, and that's another kind of, that's another kind of emerging field in fibromyalgia and kind of an emerging realization that there's also these, you know, these blood flow problems. And, uh, and that's another way the, the fields are merging together. I would, I, I might, I might add that, you know, five small fiber neuropathy, this is the fields are way too, they're way too siloed, I guess. Uh, it's just, it's just crazy how few fibromyalgia researchers study MECFS and vice versa, but the, the small fiber neuropathy findings uh, showed up in uh, fibromyalgia, I think in 2013. And, uh, you know, and they, researchers have just jumped on it. I mean, there have been dozens of small fiber neuropathy studies in fibromyalgia. And uh, the first one finally showed up in chronic fatigue syndrome this year. And yes, it did find high levels of 
small fiber neuropathy. So, <laughs> I mean, there does seem to be such kind of parallels between what you've talked about with fibromyalgia and what, what you've talked about with um, MECFS. But before we dive into a little bit more of that, um, the, um, somebody asked whether, whether the um, small fiber neuropathy causes the loss of things like fingerprints. Um, and another query about whether you've ever come across a study um, that people um, suggest that people um, grow extra pain receptors through fibromyalgia. Um, yes. Yes, I have, I have never, that's an interesting question regarding the, uh, the missing fingerprints that's also found in uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. And uh, for some reason, for whatever reason, I have never heard that referred to as a possible consequence of small fibromyopathy. Uh, it certainly seems to make sense, but I have never, that has, that has just never come up. It, it, maybe it's be, it could be because it's kind of an obscure uh, symptom, not to people with fibromyalgia, but to the medical world. They, don't, they haven't really latched onto that very much, but uh, at least as of yet, I haven't heard that connection being made. Um, yeah, there is a uh, Dr. Martinez Lavin, uh, I think is his name. He has proposed that uh, that the dorsal around the dorsal root ganglia, which is this kind of central communication uh, station between the nerves in the body and the nerves in the uh, spine, it, tra it transmits all these uh, signals, and he believes that. Uh, that in fibromyalgia, that these these all these uh, these kind of pain receptive nerves have kind of sprouted in this in these dorsal root ganglia. Uh, these these are really this is a really crucial kind of central relay station, uh, and he believes that they have uh, at least in that area they have uh, kind of sprouted up. And that's one reason that all these, this tremendous volume of pain signals are being sent to the brain. Uh, and, you know, it's, it, some people have suggested that, you know, so that the, the, they've sent the gates, there should, there should be these gates that, uh, that kind of filter out the pain, you know, the, the sensory signals from the body. They just kind of modulate them so that the, so that the, the brain is receiving the correct flow of signals that it can handle and doesn't need all the signals <laughs> all the signals it wants a certain stream of well characterized organized signals and so there's some there's some there's some there's some hypotheses that these gates these these pain gates have just been broken down in fibromyalgia and, and the uh and the brain is just being whacked with all these signals pain signals and it's just being overwhelmed by them and that's um, and that's setting off this uh, these uh, these pain producing pathways and the limbic system uh, and all that. Um, okay, thank you, thank so, yeah. you. Yeah. Do um, I mean diagnosis of fibromyalgia? Um, it seems I I think I mean the real question is how confident should people feel about their diagnosis of fibromyalgia? This is not an easy one. There is obviously much debate and lots of discussion. And, um, and, and perhaps I'll follow that up with a question about what, what you think the kind of current state of medical education is. But what, what should people feel about their diagnosis? Should they feel confident? Should they feel satisfied? Should they be pursuing other avenues? How, what, what have you come across in the, in the diagnostic sphere? Um. Well, the diagnostic field in uh, fibromyalgia was in turmoil for quite a while. There, there was first mm. the, um, they used the uh, pressure points. Yeah. Pressure points were used to be, yeah. were used as a diagnostic tool. And, you know, eventually they, uh, you know, after they studied them more, they realized that they don't, that they, they were, they were, they were, they weren't an accurate, accurate measure. So now, now that now there are, so now that they, they, they created a, and I don't, I don't have this all together, but they created a kind of a more uh, broad-based diagnostic tool. Uh, 
And but but I would say I would say if you've been diagnosed with fibromyalgia that that you can you can probably you can trust that diagnosis. Just the 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 issue there is whether whether you should stop there, whether that's the end of the story, you know. Uh, I mean, there's there've been uh, you now it's long been said that you know whether you're di diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia depends on which uh, doctor you go to. Yeah. Uh, uh, although you know there are some people with chronic fatigue syndrome who don't experience much pain, but most of the but pain is very high on the chronic fatigue syndrome symptom scale, and fatigue is high on the uh, fibromyalgia scale. Uh, so, but the question is, do you do you also is there also something else that could inform your treatment options, like small fiber neuropathy, like uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, do you have hypermobile joints or do you have joint hyper, hypermobility? Do you, mo mass cell activation syndrome is a kind of a new diagnosis, but boy, is it catching on fast. Um, do you have, do you have, uh, do you experience migraines? A lot of people who have migraines don't realize they have migraines and there are now excellent drugs for migraines. Uh, do you also, do you have irritable bowel, irritable bowel syndrome? Uh, do you have orthostatic intolerance? You know, you know, some, if you have orthostatic intolerance and you're not getting treated for it, then uh, that will impact exercise, that will impact cognition, that will impact pain, uh, that will impact, certainly impact your functionality because, you know, if you're, if you're upright, you know, some people, if you're sitting, it's just sitting up in a chair or if you're walking around, if your symptoms worsen when you're walking around, you may very ha well have orthostatic intolerance and, and dysautonomia. And that, and that is another, I mean, there just, there aren't that many dysautonomia specialists out there. Uh, but that is another, that is another legitimate and very common uh, diagnosis in these diseases, if it's looked for. It, do you have uh, Sjogren's syndrome? That's a really interesting one because Sjogren's syndrome can cause all these different symptoms. Uh, and there's a story on the website about Lauren Stiles, the founder of the Dysautonomia International website. It's just a great website. And uh, she went through diagnosis after diagnosis after diagnosis, chronic syndrome, fibromyalgia, POTS, blah, 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 blah. And finally, she had a, a and she had autoimmune tests done. This is autoimmune disease. It did not show up. Finally, she had a lip biopsy done. What she actually had was Sjogren's syndrome, which was causing all this, these, this, uh, these uh, dysautonomia symptoms. So, uh, really, you know, if you can, I don't. And I know it's probably not easy in the UK. It's probably harder in the UK. But you know, seeing a doctor who will just check out all these possible diagnoses. Uh, could be very helpful, could be very helpful with regards to treatment. And what about distinguishing the diagnosis of ME and fibromyalgia? And so many people seem to have both diagnoses and it's complicated how they fit together, isn't it? Well, it is, it is complicated. There, there are some differences. Uh, people with fibromyalgia seem to be able to exercise more. Yeah. Uh, and you know, there have been many exercise studies in uh, fibromyalgia, successful exercise studies. In fact, it's probably the most well-studied part of fibromyalgia. They seem to have gone a bit crazy with exercise studies. I would, I would really, I would really rather they spend a little more money on uh, pathophysiology. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, but there are, there are, there are some, there are, there are some differences. Um, and I, you know, I would just keep I would just keep aware of both fields. Just try mm -hmm. and keep aware of both fields. And Health Rising is a good place to do that because we try and cover we we can't cover everything, but uh, just see what's happening in both fields and watch what's happening in long COVID. I just read a study where they found high degrees of musco musculoskeletal pain in long COVID, and that's that's that sounds very much like fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. And the long COVID patients, they have fatigue, they have pain, they have cognitive problems, they have sleep issues, that, that core right there, you know, you don't see, there aren't many other diseases that have this, you know, this kind of widespread core of, 
uh, significant symptoms, the pain, fatigue, sleep, cognitive issues, and, you know, and some people put orthostatic intolerance in there. So long COVID has it, fibromyalgia has it, MECFS has it. I would keep, a, I would just keep your an eye on all three of these, these illnesses and, and definitely keep an eye on long COVID because long COVID, the long COVID research has the has the possibility of just explaining so much. Yeah. Um, it is um yes it is unfortunate that something that's affecting so many people may actually um um provide the resources needed to um unravel this kind of the current mysteries of fibro and, and ucfs do um well, before we move nice, on to if i could just say let's just say it's nice that there's a silver line <laughs> okay true yes true you know yeah. you know there are other pump infectious diseases as well uh, so, and they're never, they've never been studied. They've never, yeah. they've never, they've never been focused study on post-infectious illnesses and now there will be, and that, yeah. that could help a lot of people. Yeah. Do, could you comment at all about what you think the state of medical education is and, and do you know any good practice in medical education? Oh, medical education is always a, it's always a difficult issue. I mean, we're not, I mean, Fibromyalgia is definitely more embedded in the in the medical education system than chronic fatigue syndrome. Chronic fatigue syndrome is hardly embedded at all. Uh, the problem with fibromyalgia is that the the really the, you know what it really is a vast field it has been. Uh, I mentioned the muscle problems, the mitochondrial problems, uh, the small fiber neuropathy, you know, the orthostatic intolerance, and you know, medical education, so far as I know, is mostly focused on the central nervous system problems. But the problem is there aren't any real good drugs, I mean, for, you know, to treat the central nervous system problems. Some people do have, pro do, do do well with Lyrica and Cymbalta and uh, Savella, I think, do I have those right? Do 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 well with the three FDA approved drugs in the US, but, but most, a lot of people don't. Uh, so, and that's what doctors learn. You know, they learn, they, they'll give them an antidepressant, they give them, you know, one of these drugs, they give them an opioid, and that's it. So, you know, fibromyalgia just needs to be, it needs better research, it needs to be further embedded in the, uh, in the medical system, it needs to be further recognized. It's amazing that it's not, that some doctors still, despite decades of studies and finding problem after problem that that doctors still some doctors still do not think fibromyalgia is, is a real or serious disease one of, one of the problems is that fibromyalgia landed in the rheumatology field and it's nothing like the the other auto autoimmune diseases in that field so the doctors are they're just not equipped of course they could be equipped they just need to study up on it but they're just not equipped. I, I, my guess is that fibromyalgia is going to move into the neurological field uh, here, and I, and I, and I, and I really hope that uh, you know, at least here in in, in the uh, U.S. and the National Institute of National Institutes of Health, it gets, you know, the diseases are broken up into different institutes, and it's it's now in the rheumatological institute. I really hope it gets moved to the neurological institute because that's where it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's been a problem, but yeah, med med medical education is a real problem. I, I will I'll make a plug for um, uh, Ellie Stein's uh, Pathways to Improvement course, uh, which is an online course that people with MECFS, fibromyalgia, and environmental illness can take. And I think it's a ten session course where she just goes over the building blocks, you know, from pacing to pain management to sleep to whatever and uh that's not going to help doctors but uh but it could help patients and uh i think that's a that's a good basic approach from from somebody who's had these diseases and has studied them intensively uh a good basic approach and i, th I think there's probably there may be a link to her to an explanation of that class Thank you. And just to note that um, Court has kindly agreed to send us um, lots of, of the links that are mentioned today. So we will be able to send them out to people um, by email or e-news, but also um, 
when we put this talk up on YouTube, we can put those links in the in the YouTube comments later on our website. So, um, so huge, yeah. Thank you for all that um, critical information. So, having having looked at to kind of research and diagnosis and medical education, can we move into the um, the big big question, which is like treatments and and the future? It is a big question, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> That's the one we'd all like answered. Absolutely. That's why <laughs> yeah, we, we invited you, Court. Can you sort it? <laughs> well, we'd all, we'd, all, we'd all like not to have to ask that question, wouldn't yeah. we? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, you know, as I noted, the, uh, the, the big three in the US, the drugs, they do help some people, but they're, but they're really not effective for a lot of people and they, they can produce lots of side effects. Uh, and so there was, there, was a, there was just a big thrust uh, to get drugs aimed at the central nervous system. And in particular, uh, to uh, build on uh, drugs that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that improve on a particular pathway in the brain. Uh, that, these, are, these are drugs like gabapentin and Lyrica. And then there, there was recently an attempt uh, at, 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 a, at a much better lyrical called mirogabalin, they, they all access the same pathway in the brain. And um, that attempt failed. And, and it looks like, uh, you know, finally that, that has been exhausted. And I hope pharmaceutical companies look to other areas. And, and they are actually, there, there are some, there are some, there's some, there's some, there's one drug in particular that's pretty exciting and that I, I wouldn't be surprised I wouldn't be surprised now. Now, COVID has delayed a lot of clinical trials, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's not approved for for fibromyalgia in the next couple of years. And that's called I think, what's it? TNX one hundred two. Uh, it's it's actually a derivative of uh, Flexerol. And the problem with Flexerol, Flexerol is a muscle relaxant. But the uh, the problem is if you take it for very long, and it works, it apparently works very well. But if you take it for very long, this this like this toxin builds up and you have to stop taking it. But they, 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 they created a derivative of it, which, which bypasses or which bypasses that problem. And the interesting thing is that Flexerol has been found in studies to be able to both improve sleep and pain. And that's a, that's a rare combination. Mm. And uh, boy, if you know much about sleep, you know that, that sleep, uh, that sleep deprivation or sleep problems by themselves uh, uh, exacerbate pain. And, you know, in some cases, you know, it could, it could just be sleep problems that are causing the pain in fibromyalgia, or at least really amping up the pain in fibromyalgia. So if you can get a sleep and a pain drug together, boy, that's, 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 that's pretty hot. That's pretty hot. Uh, so, but there are, there are some there are some others. Uh, these I mentioned migraine earlier, and these anti uh, CGRP migraine drugs uh, have, have just been uh, from what I've read they're just they've just been revolutionary. They're just, they're a revolutionary advance in treating migraine. They took decades to develop, mm -hmm. and uh, but they but they you know multiple companies have been producing them. They you know, some of them have become FDA approved. But the interesting thing is that, that this, this pathway is also potentially uh, disrupted in uh, fibromyalgia. And we have, a, we have a story on uh, health rising of a woman with uh, fibromyalgia and migraine. And uh, her, both of them went away when she was on this drug. Now, she knows other people who had fibromyalgia and migraine, which both didn't go away, but... Uh, but a study is underway to assess anti-CGRP anti drugs in uh, fibromyalgia. So that's, that's, a, that's an interesting, that's a nice uh, possibility because these drugs are already approved for use. They already know that they're safe. And uh, so if, if the study does, if the study has a positive result, it could be, they could be become quickly available. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another, there's another, this is a fun one. Uh, there's another uh, therapy. It's called uh, rapid trans rapid transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, 
uh, it's not electroshock. <laughs> uh, it's a, uh, it's just this gentle kind of magnetic stimulation of the brain. And uh, it, and they've gotten better and better at it. And one fibromyalgia study actually produced, it takes, you have to, you have to do it for, you know, I, I don't know, a month or so, but what, but a recent fibromyalgia study found that it, it substantially improved pain six months out. So that's, that's an, that's an incredible finding. And that technology has been, you know, that technology has been rapidly developed. So I expect to hear, uh, I hope to hear more and more good things as the technology gets better and they, uh, they, they do uh, more fibromyalgia studies. Uh, and they're actually doing a study in chronic fatigue syndrome in that right now. Uh, so, and then there's, there's an interesting drug that's being, that nobody ever thought, I mean, whoever thought this drug might be of use. It's called Abilify in chronic fatigue syndrome. And uh, so Abilify is used in uh, schizophrenia, which you know obviously isn't present in either of these diseases, but it's also, uh, it, it also may have, uh, may be able to damp down neuroinflammation. And uh, several, several, quite a few people have had really good results with Abilify mm -hmm. in chronic fatigue syndrome. So I, I uh, you know, that's probably not a, a possibility for most people with fibromyalgia at, at this time, but that's, that's certainly something to uh, keep in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so other things, you know, I don't, I don't know what the cannabis situation is out there and not a lot of studies have been done, but I mean, for me, the right cannabis preparation is just gold for sleep when I can't get to sleep. Well, I, I actually wake up in the middle of the night and I can't get back to sleep. And it has excellent muscle relaxant properties and excellent pain, pain, produce, pain reducing properties. The problem is that, you know, it's just so difficult to get research done, but I, you know, I, hopefully over time that'll improve. The US will, will uh, relax its crazy restrictions on researching this, this really potentially very uh, beneficial compound uh, or this beneficial plant with its many potentially beneficial compounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see progress in that area, but, but, but some, some people do better on, uh, certainly do better on cannabis using you know, the right cannabis product than, uh, than opioid drugs. Um, and as I said, there's uh, quite a bit of research going into uh, reducing neuroinflammation. And then fine, and then, okay, two more things I have to, uh, I have to start. I have to start charging my phone. Excuse me. Uh, I'll play this one. Uh, uh, so the, the, the one, uh, one, one really promising initiative is called the Heal Initiative uh, at the National Institute of Health in the U.S. and it. And it, it was birthed by the problems with the opioid epidemic and the need to find better pain drugs. And it, it's, it's pumping $500 million into understanding how pain is caused and, and use that understanding to develop better drugs. So I, I, uh, Jared Younger said they hope, to, uh, they hope that, that five to 15 new pain drugs come out of this initiative. And that would be astonishing because it's been very difficult it's been very difficult to produce a good pain drug. So that's another, that's another thing. That's another hope for the future. Another sign that, you know, that there's, uh, that the future will be brighter than the past. Um, and excuse me, I'm kind of going a little blood sugary, low blood sugary. So in the meantime, I, re I really, uh, I th really think it's a good idea to try mindfulness approaches just to try and tamp down the pain and have a better quality of life. Um, we have an incredible story on the website of a mindfulness approach developed by Dr. Michael Moskowitz of a woman who was just, her back was so shattered that the uh, surgeons would not operate on it. And she was in 24, 24 seven pain. She was taking loads of uh, opioids 
And, but she used Dr. Moskowitz's mindful type, mindfulness techniques. And she is out and about now. And she is out of pain. And her back has not been, has not been operated on. It is still the same. It is the most amazing thing I've ever heard of my life. Uh, so Dr. Michael Moskowitz, and there should be a, uh, a link. Uh, and then, you know, then, then there's this program called the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program, which I imagine is present in uh, the UK. It is, uh, it's all over the US. Uh, and it, used, it, it was actually developed for people who could not handle, for whom pain drugs did not work. And it is, it is mindfulness, it is meditation, it's calming the system down. It is, because there are two parts to the pain process. There's the pain sensation and then there's a the part of the brain that goes wow this is really bad it amps everything up it creates suffering it creates uh, you know emotional emotional turmoil so these this 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 program calms down that other side so you can just be with the pain sensation and once and apparently once you do that it's no i haven't i haven't achieved that I haven't achieved that, but but apparently, if you can do that, then you know, your the um, suffering that pain causes, uh, mm -hmm. diminish can just diminish dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the and the amygdala retraining program in the UK. That's one avenue to to kind of see if you can see, see you know just improve quality of life, reduce pain, reduce fatigue a bit. And just uh, hold on. Uh, and then, lastly, I'd like to say that uh, Health Rising has uh, created what's called the Ending Suffering Project. And this 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 project is is dedicated to the notion that the Buddhist notion that pain is inevitable, but suffering is is optional. So, in this project, we're going to go around and we're going to we're going to speak to people who who are skillful in this area and see if we can find ways to just reduce the suffering and improve quality of life um, just as things are. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's an ongoing project. It's just started. Uh, and I really encourage people to look in and see if something, there's something that uh, appeals to them. This is a, this is a wide, this is a vast field, this mindfulness field, it's a vast field. And, uh, and I really, it was born out of the idea that I think long COVID is going to really provide answers, but it's going to take some time. And I was, I'm just afraid that some people aren't going to make it, you know, particularly in the ME world, who are just suffering so much. So I just want everybody to be able to hang on. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah, I mean, certainly our group offers as much kind of Qigong and Tai Chi and um, other similar programs, yeah. really, to mm -hmm. um, to enable people to come together and actually kind of experience and, and support each other um, through that experience of, of managing the levels of um, pain and suffering they're in. Do yeah. you, and there is there is plenty of mindfulness stuff in, in the UK, so the Mindfulness for Health book by Danny Penman and Jim Marla Birch is a kind of very straightforward eight week program that um, that people can do i've still got a few more questions court but i'm mm -hmm. i i i want to make sure you're not running out of of spoons and um are you are you okay for a little bit longer for another 10 minutes maybe I, i'm doing surprisingly well you're okay. given my uh, my yeah. sleep status last night so i can hang in there a little bit longer sure Thank you, thank you. Um, there's a couple of kind of very specific questions, which is um, having talked about treatments, do we actually know what causes neuroinflammation? And is there any potential link with, um, um, uh, I've lost the link, is it, is, uh, what's the name of it, Bartonosis, the, um, the cat flea um, bacterial infection spread by cats? Um, oh, whether you come across I don't know. I don't, know. I, don't, I don't really know anything about the uh, okay. bacterial infection. Uh, uh, but what causes neuroinflammation? That is that is a great question. And uh, so, but that but that gives me the opportunity to refer to a fascinating UK uh, funded study from ME Research UK. Uh, they're a great organization. 
and this is one of the most interesting studies. <laughs> so they they have funded Jared Younger. So one of the things that can cause neuroinflammation is a leaky br blood brain barrier, which um, which allows immune cells from the body into the brain. And the brain has its own immune cells. So it doesn't, only in the most dire circumstances will it, should it allow uh, immune cells from the body and the brain, because once, once they get into the brain, they're just going to, they're just going to, they're going to wreak havoc. They're going to cause a lot of damage. Maybe they will get rid of whatever, if there's an infection of the brain, maybe they will help get rid of it, but they are going to cause a lot of damage while doing it. So you never want you almost never want, unless you're in real danger, you never want immune cells from the body into the brain. And so I mean, Research UK is funding Jared Younger to see if immune cells are leaking from the body into the brain. And I think it's, I think it's chronic fatigue, it's chronic fatigue syndrome, but, but just think fibromyalgia as well. Uh, so uh, that's, that's one way. There's another way, it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, there's a part of the brain called the basal ganglia, which is the reward center of the brain, but it also governs movement. It also, it also mo governs movement. It's, it's actually what gets attacked. A part of the basal ganglia gets attacked in uh, Parkinson's and it causes the, uh, the, uh, the movement problems in Parkinson's. But so a guy named, uh, Oh, I can't believe I can't remember his name. Maybe I'll remember. He worked, he's at Emory. Uh, he did this. He did this uh, fascinating study where he showed. What he showed is that the basal ganglia is impaired. It's not working well in chronic fatigue syndrome, and he's able to link those problems that 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 is those basal ganglia problems with uh, fatigue severity. But he but he's also shown though is that. During an infection, inflammation, inflammation, well, an infection can cause, apparently the basal ganglia is really sensitive to inflammation. And, uh, and if, if it gets, it can get tweaked during an infection so that it becomes hypersensitive to inflammation. And then, and then it triggers, you know, other parts of the brain to just start pouring out pro-inflammatory cytokines. And uh, so pro-inflammatory cytokines equals neuroinflammation. So that's another way uh, that somehow the basal ganglia, this critical organ in the brain has gotten tweaked and now it's just on all the time. And uh, and I I'm sure I'm sure there are I'm sure there are many ways. I mean there are there there's there may be problems with blood flow in the brain. Uh, this, these anti-CGRP migraine drugs, they're, they're checking out, they're, they're, they're affecting blood flows in the trigeminal nerve. But there are several studies suggest there are problems with blood flows in the brain. If you have, if you have low blood flows, that produces hypoxia, that produces a lot of high oxidative stress, mm -hmm. and that causes inflammation. So those are, there, there's three ways, and I'm sure there are, there are many others actually. And and this 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 is a uh, this is going to be an important this should be an important uh, research avenue in long COVID mm. as well. And and okay, one last one. So they have actually shown that inflammation gut problems can actually send signals to the brain that cause inflammation in the brain. So there's the gut issue, and we uh, I think it was in chronic fatigue syndrome. There was a really interesting study by a UK UK doctor who had very, very, really excellent results with um, um, fecal transplants, you know, really good results. And we, we're going to have a recovery story on, on, on uh, health rising about that. Uh, and some, so that actually worked for some people. And boy, wouldn't that be nice if that, if that was all it took, you know. So the gut is another huge issue in actually a huge issue in both chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. Mm, thank you. And we we've we had a um, a brilliant talk which is on our website um, from um, the Quantum Institute about the work that they've been doing about um, transplants and and uh, gut oh, microbes. Good. 
which is is fabulous. Yeah, that was that was really informative. Can I just um um do a little bit of um um checking in about the the long COVID and fibromyalgia kind of interconnections? Um, can long COVID cause fibromyalgia? Are people with fibromyalgia more likely to experience long COVID as a result of catching COVID? What's what is that inter interrelationship? Do we know? Uh, well, we don't know, but I would be yeah. I would be totally shocked if it didn't cause fibromyalgia. I would just yeah. be totally shocked if it didn't. I mean, there are certainly people in the fibromyalgia community who come down with fibromyalgia after an infection. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true with regard to POTS. Of course, it's true with regard to MECFS. Uh, so uh, there's that, and and I mean, I just I just think that the symptoms are just are just too similar uh, that in, you know, in chronic fatigue syndrome and, and fibromyalgia, I, I just think there must be similar underlying pathways and long COVID in, uh, in, all, of these, in all of these diseases. And so if they, can, uh, if they can figure out what's going on in long COVID, and I'm sure there will be, there, there should, I'm sure there'll be quite a few subsets I just read a study and they, and they, and they talked as they do at Crohn's Fatigue Center about the heterogeneous findings, you know, that, that, you know, it's a heterogeneous group. And, uh, but, you know, the, um, you know, the, some of the long COVID studies are so big and so comprehensive that they, they actually have the muscle to uncover, really, they should have the muscle to uncover, you know, these subsets that are hiding in, probably hiding in fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. And uh, so I'm very, I'm, I'm really very hopeful. I, I don't know if, if you know, but you know, the U.S. passed this shockingly, in New the U.S. Congress uh, just went way beyond what they expected. And they, they funneled uh, over a billion dollars into long COVID research. Uh, so that's a lot of money. <laughs> that's a lot of money. And uh, I can't imagine it won't produce real insights into, into all these, these diseases. It may take a little bit longer for fibromyalgia because fibromyalgia researchers, you know, to integrate it into their field of study. But uh, uh, I, just, I, just, I just can't imagine that we aren't gonna learn a lot. Uh, um, and with regard to people who come down with long COVID who have fibromyalgia, we did, a, we did a really interesting survey. We did not break them up into MECFS and fibromyalgia patients. They're, they're, they're put together. So we don't, know, we don't know how it breaks out, but I, it, was, uh, it turned out that, that people who had an infectious event during long COVID, uh, you know, and of course many of them uh, couldn't get, weren't able to get tested for it, particularly in the, in the, in the early stages. Yeah that I think it was 40% were still not back to baseline mm. uh, three months later. Mm. So they are having, they're, that, that suggests people who, people with our illnesses who get long COVID, <clears throat> a substantial number of them could have, could have real, real trouble. That's far higher. That's a far higher percentage, by the way. Yeah. We also done polls on the vaccines. <clears throat> That's a far higher percentage yeah. of people who don't do well with the vaccines. Most people, most people don't do 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 fine. You know, they they have more symptoms. They probably have more symptoms than people than healthy people, but they get over them. You know, fairly quickly. That there is a, uh, a significant percentage. You know, I don't know, ten or fifteen percent who really have a lot of trouble with the vaccines. But there's also a percentage of people, oddly enough, who improve, who are improving. Uh, after getting the vaccination, and nobody expected that. So, um, so yeah. I hope someone's researching that because that's absolutely fascinating, isn't it? What, um, how the vaccine has, you know, trip started, jump started something um, to happen. Who knows, really? It's, um, it's extraordinary, extraordinary. Yes. Well, you can certainly say, at least with the early patients, no placebo effect because nobody expected yes. it. <laughs> yeah. The um, um, various people have asked about um, things like the Perrin technique and osteopathy, whether there's a link with um, fibromyalgia and spondylosis or cranial instability or some of those kind of more structural um, issues. Have you, have you got any further comments on those? 
Oh yeah, boy, the boy, the, the spinal structural issue issue is uh, boy, that is that is really something. I mean that that is really there. I don't know how many people have it. And there there was a study which actually did not find much cranial cervical instability, and in, I think it was chronic fatigue syndrome. But you know, but the doctors are finding it. Um, and this whole, just the whole neck and spine area is just, just fascinating, really. Um, uh, uh, Ray Perrin, I, I love, I love his ideas. I haven't tried, I haven't tried the technique, uh, but I think he's really got something there. You know, mm -hmm. there, there is, you know, the, the idea that the lymphatic flows from the brain are not getting, are not, are not. The lymphatic flows are not flowing properly. It's causing toxins to build up in the brain. Uh, that that is that is that is really interesting. And then and then there is this really interesting finding of intracranial high levels of intracranial hypertension in uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, which again suggests that um, uh, that that there there's the just you know this this is another fluid. This is another fluid problem, fluid flowing problem. You know, like in the blood vessels, there. You know, there's there's a lot of interest in there's something the matter with the blood vessels in in some people and and in chronic fatigue syndrome, and I assume this applies to fibromyalgia. There, I mean, Systrom is finding that the uh, that in a certain subset of patients, it seems significant subset, it seems like there's that when, it, when, it, when the blood is about to get to the muscles, it gets shunted away from them. And it, you know, it, and so the, the muscles don't get blood, enough blood, they don't get enough oxygen, they don't get enough T ATP, et cetera. Uh, so in this, so Ray is describing another, another fluid flowing problem. And I, you know, he, I, I just think that, you know, with the, with the intracranial hypertension, possibly high levels of that, uh, I think it's possible he's really got something there. Um, and my partner, my partner actually, you know, if you've ever had a cerebral spinal tap, you lose some, you lose some fluid, uh, and they can measure the pressure uh, as they're doing. When they, when they open it up, uh, they can measure the pressure there. Uh, and so when I had a cerebral spinal tap, you know, right after, right after they took took. Uh, they took some of the spinal fluid out. Uh, God, I just felt, I just felt calm. I just felt calm like I hadn't felt in a long time. Wow. <laughs> and my partner actually had a two week remission of her uh, POTS and her cognitive problems. Uh, I mean, you could call it what she has, MECFS FM POTS. And, uh, and then, it, then it just came back, but there's something, you know, that whole area is just mm. fascinating, really. Just fascinating. Wow. Well, I mean, the, the other, you know, big question that people want to know is, do you know what the kind of recovery rate is from fibromyalgia? Do people slowly, slowly, you know, have, I have no idea. slowly improve? I, do we know? Does anybody know? I, I, I don't remember seeing studies. No, uh, I don't. Like what I have seen is that a study with just, just a, just a damning study, really, which, which there's a large study. It showed People, uh, people going on the FDA-approved drugs, and then with a year, um, majority of them dropping off, and their symptoms remain the same. Um, so we do have, but you know, of course, we do. We have recovery story, fibromyalgia recovery stories on Health Rising. Recovery, recovery, absolutely does occur. Um, and uh, so I don't think it. I don't think it happens very often. I'm almost sure it doesn't happen very often, but yeah, it, it's sure, sure it occurs. I mean, it occurs in chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah. And occasionally you get somebody who is um, just completely disabled, you know, in bed mm. and uh, very occasionally and, and they recover completely. So we just, there's just not enough of them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we need, we need more research. We need more research. And, and the heal initiative, you know, the long COVID, those are, you know, I think we're going to learn a lot. And there's also the NIH launched this thing called the Brain Initiative. The brain is very important. 
Big Brain Initiative. And they also launched a thing called the Spark Initiative, which is about um, using the uh, electrical circuits in the body mm. to improve health. And with the, you know, with the, with all the, you know, all the problems they, they've uncovered in the uh, nerves in the body leading to the spine with fibromyalgia, that's another potential. There's another, there's, there are potential breakthroughs out there. Uh, and what about, do you know the work of Dr. Alan Moreau? Do you know the work of Dr. Alan Moreau? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Doc, Dr. Moreau is a, uh, he's working with the open, he opened uh, the open, one of the Open Medicine Foundation's yeah. um, research centers in Montreal. Uh, Dr. Moreau, he's a real, he's a real uh, go-getter. He's, um, he's, uh, you know, he's just, you know, I, of course other people have helped, but he's been the leader in the, in the Canadian effort. Uh, and, um, and he, you know, he, he recently, he did a recent really interesting paper. I think it was on messenger RNA in uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. And uh, boy, the paper was 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 very interesting, and it was really well received. It got you know researchers, a lot of researchers read it. Uh, and he's also come up with this way to possibly assess uh, post-exertional malaise without having people exercise. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he's a great addition. He's another. He's just another recent and uh, really nice addition to the field. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it's another Absolutely. good. Sign. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm um, hugely, hugely grateful to you, Court, for uh, for giving us such a kind of um, tour of the, the whole um, feast of, well, the, all the hot topics and some of the names to watch and uh, really, really, really appreciate uh, uh, your joining our group today and um, sharing an incredible amount of knowledge. So I just want to say a massive thank you from everybody here. I don't know whether everybody here is from Sheffield. I think people are, are no, no, from Oregon, USA, from all over the place, all over the place. Mm -hmm. So um, very, very much appreciated. Uh, you're an incredible mind of research information. It's absolutely phenomenal. We so appreciate the blog that you do. And um, please keep on with the work. We love what you do. And thank you very, very much for joining us today we really appreciate it and um oh look people are from cambridge and somerset and all over the place so yeah it's been really really helpful and very very appreciative of being able to actually have a conversation about fibromyalgia being the number one topic um so brilliant thank you so much court and thank you to everybody who's helped organize today and you will be able to see this again if you want to watch it again and catch some of those names um, we will be posting this video on YouTube later on when we've done a little bit of editing or whatever we need to do. And um, uh, yeah, thank you. And we wish you all the very, very best and, and um, enjoy the sunshine where you are. We're very envious. I've just painted my wall blue, you know, that's the best I can do. <laughs> oh, thank you, yeah. Coach. Well, I didn't mention that it's going to be in the low 80s today. Brilliant sunshine. I really shouldn't mention that, but. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for giving me the opportunity to i don't know blab about all this it's you know obviously it's just a passion of mine it always has been it has been for me for quite a while and uh thank you very much for the invitation i enjoyed it lovely really pleased to see you thank you court okay and you take Thanks. care yes yes thank everybody you. out there take care yeah. yes cheers bye then cheers